Welcome back to the Lightning Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Castellino. And for a very long time, we've been moving through the book of 1 Samuel. And this episode, we're going to get into chapter 18. Okay, so with the defeat of Goliath in the last chapter, the book is going to shift officially in its focus. We started with the story of Samuel. He was a child of promise who grew up to become a prophet and judge. Then the narrative moved on to Samuel's successor, first king of Israel, Saul, who failed to live up to his calling. As Saul began to fade in importance, we met David, the man after God's own heart. Chapters 16 and 17 that we looked at introduced us to David and told us of his early successes. We're at chapter 18, which begins David's journey from shepherd boy to king. It's going to be a very long journey. Now, in the last episode, I talked about the, vi- the final few verses, and I said that this marks a dark chapter in David's life. Already in that moment, Saul was starting to look at David differently ever since he killed the giant. And things will only get worse for David as the king desperately tries to stamp out the man who will obviously replace him. Now, this will span many chapters all the way to the end of this book. And there's a lot we can learn from it. And it's something that we can't really cover everything in just a podcast. But there's a major theme that will come clear through these trials. And that is God's plan in the midst of all of it. The sad reality is in modern American Christianity, we've been programmed to think that the walk of faith is only about blessings. If you go to a Christian bookstore or a local bookstore and you find the section on religion, if it has one, you'll see most of the Christian quote-unquote books, they're not about studying scripture, they're not about pursuing God according to his word, there are very few books on theology or study. Instead, they're going to be these very light, flimsy, uh, topical books about overcoming and achieving your dreams and finding yourself. We have been taught by modern-day false prophets and teachers that walking with God means getting everything you ever wanted. They teach this because it's popular and it makes them rich and successful, but it's not the truth. Walking with God does mean you are blessed. Yes, absolutely, very blessed. But God's definition of blessing is different than our own. Isaiah 55, 8 says God's ways are above our ways. So his ideas about blessing you are very different. Remember, Jesus said what man esteems is despised by God in Luke 16, 15. And the vice versa is true. Stories like David's trials after the defeat of Goliath are largely ignored by modern churches. Or they reinterpret them to mean something other than what God is saying. So what is the truth? Following God means going through trials. The entire Bible testifies to this. Psalm 34, 19 even says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous. David went through a season of hell according to God's plan. Now just think about it. God had anointed him to be a king when he was only 15 or 16. And not just king over any nation, but Israel, God's chosen people. That was amazing. That was a blessing, yes. But a teenage boy is not fit to rule a great people. While he was faithful in believing God, David would have been consumed with pride and other sins had he jumped into that role immediately. Which is exactly what happened to Saul, if you remember. Instead, God had a better plan for David. And that plan included betrayal, the constant fear of death, living estranged from his family and his nation, even sleeping in a dirty cave. All of those things that David is about to experience are not glitches or mistakes interfering with God's plan. They were intended. Those trials were ordained by God so that God could use them to change David into a mature, wise, effective leader. Now the same is true for us. 
You might be going through trials in your life and you're being told by so-and-so, this person on YouTube or this conference that you just have to activate your faith. You just have to rise up. You just have to reach out and claim your, your promises. And they project onto you this idea that if, if you're a Christian and if you're a believer, everything is going to be a bed of roses and your entire life will be blessed and perfect. That is not what scripture teaches. God's plan for you as a believer in Christ is not to bless you in the way that you might be imagining. He does provide for us, yes, and abundantly so. 1 Timothy 6.17 says, God gives us abundantly all things to enjoy. But his real intentions for you is not to become a fat, bloated, happy, blessed, lazy person with an easy life, no responsibilities or cares. His plan, according to Romans 8.29, is to conform you to the image of his son. God's blessing, his plan for your life, is for you to become like Jesus. I could spend quite a bit of time talking about how do we know God's plan for our life? What is God's will for our life? How do I hear God's voice? What do I do? And that is valid, and any sincere follower of Christ should be asking those questions. But the first step in that answer is to affirm that God wants you to become like Jesus. He wants you to reflect his character, righteousness, and holiness for you to bear all the fruit of the Spirit, according to Galatians 5. But that doesn't happen just through good experiences and blessings. It comes chiefly through times of hard testing, which refine your faith like gold in the fire, which is what Peter said in 1 Peter 1.7. So what does trials and difficulties accomplish? Many things, really. Going through hard times while you're trusting in the Lord burns away your dependence on yourself. It also exposes your weaknesses and unconfessed sin, if there's any. It teaches you just how powerless you are and how much you need the grace of Jesus. Which is exactly what Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Trials, simply put, mature us by getting us to depend on God more. And that is mainly how our faith grows. And that, in the end, is the true blessing. Not material wealth or comfort, not having everything we ever dreamed, but being blessed by, be by being matured in the Lord. Through trials, we learn more about the the importance, the priority of grace in our walk of faith. Grace means undeserved favor from God. Favor God is freely giving to you, not because you've earned it or did anything right, but because God, through Christ, has earned it for you. Trials teach us to stop depending on ourselves or our obedience or our good works and instead depend on that freely given grace to sustain us. Some of you were taught grace is there when you're a sinner and then you're saved. And after that, it's a walk of obedience in order to keep pleasing God. That is not what the Bible teaches. And if you don't believe me, reread Galatians. Grace is the beginning and end of our faith. Paul says in Romans 5, grace is what we stand on. Everything you do has to be supplied with God's grace. His working through you. We don't always see that when things are going well. We convince ourselves it's our doing. When we go through hard times, when we're emptied of ourself, when we have no resources left to exploit, we learn to depend on God and see His grace, His favor working in our lives. But it, it doesn't end there. We do that depending on the Lord because the Lord is the one who will bring us through the trials. We don't stay in the trials. We don't live there forever. They're temporary. God brings us through them and we see the Lord deliver us again and again. That's the second half of Psalm 34, 19. The whole verse is, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. You can't even do that yourself. That's the hope we cling to. God doesn't leave us in the valley of the shadow of death. We are there for a little while, as Peter writes in 1 Peter 5, 10, But God himself will come and deliver us. Peter writes, After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. 
You go through a hard time trusting in the Lord. Once that time is over, he himself, he won't send someone else. He won't send a third party. He's not sending an angel. He's not sending a person. He himself will come by his grace and perfect, confirm, strengthen, establish you, be there for you, strengthen you, give you what you need. So in the end, blessings, both defined by God and ourselves, will come, but not without the fire. And believe me, my friend, you can avoid the trials if you really want to. When problems come, you could always take the easy way out. You could run from them, try to fix them yourself, or even orchestrate your entire life so you could avoid all pain, all difficulty, all hard work, all confrontations, all grief. That's possible to a certain extent. But where will that leave you? Years will come and go, and by the end of your life, you will have missed God. I'm not saying you're not saved or you're going to lose your salvation or anything like that. You can be born again Christian and still do this. Yes, you're saved, but you were never sanctified. You never grew up. You never matured as a Christian. And when you stand before Christ on the last day, which we know is coming soon, all you will have to show for your faith would be wood, hay, and straw. So take a lesson from David. Don't run from the problems, but run to Christ who will sustain you, will provide for you, and will, in time, deliver you out of them. That's exactly what he does for David. That's a lot of preamble, I know, before even getting into the chapter. But it's needed if we want to read the next few chapters of 1 Samuel with the right mindset. Keep this in mind. God is not abandoning David nor what he's about to go through, the result of some sin or mistake that David makes. God is using this entire season of difficulty to prepare David, just like he prepares us. But the chapter begins with something positive. As always, God is providing comfort and hope even in the midst of coming trials. So we're looking at 1 Samuel chapter 18, just the first five verses. Now it came about when he had finished speaking to Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as himself. Saul took him that day and did not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David with his armor, including his sword and bow and belt. So David went out wherever Saul sent him and prospered. And Saul set him over the men of war. And it was pleasing in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servants. So this kind of briefly shows the promotion and success David had after his victory over Goliath. There is a time we see that David will be Saul's chief commander over the army and he's prospering and good things are happening. And we know Saul, for all his faults, was a shrewd military strategist. So he wasn't going to neglect the talent like David, who was his servant and gladly wanted to fight. So Saul keeps David close, recognizing his skill and favor from God. This is what this passage is telling us. Now verses 1 through 4 reveal the close friendship that is formed between Jonathan and David. Way back in chapter 14, you might remember, last time we saw Jonathan... He's the prince, the son of King Saul, and he achieved this great victory during a very critical time in battle. Jonathan and just one other man, his armor bearer, defeated dozens of soldiers and helped turn the tide of the battle. But how was he able to do it? Jonathan had great confidence in the Lord. He says, if the Lord gives us this day, it doesn't matter how many men we have. We're going to go and win the victory. And God does. And so we see Jonathan was a lot like David. He trusted in the God of Israel, even when his father Saul had turned away. It was that common faith in God that brought these two men together. The Bible says that the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And twice it says Jonathan loved David as he loved himself. These are powerful words to describe the bond these two men had. Obviously, the world has tried to distort this relationship in this passage and others later on 
trying to claim that David and Jonathan were in love or had some kind of sexual relationship. But nothing can be further from the truth. As we've seen, the men had a bond because of their faith in the Lord. People who have a common faith often find they are closely knit one to another. It is something that God does between us. Romans 5 says his love is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And we feel a sense of kinship, even with people we're not related to. Paul regularly expresses this kind of love for the churches that he served. It is something that transcends human reasoning, which is why unbelievers distort it so horrifically. There's also another reason why David and Jonathan were probably so close. They were brothers in arms. Now, I'm not a military man, but I know a few. And there are very few things in life that can bind men together like serving in combat. David and Jonathan were men of war. They fought and killed enemies. They looked death right in the face. Over the coming years, they probably fought together on more than one occasion. Now, when you live through something like that, you have a bond that is forged in fire. And the same can be said of people who go through all kinds of trials together. As believers, we are commanded to support one another in love. We face hardships, persecutions, difficulties, betrayals, and crises together. When one of the brethren are in pain, we all are in pain. Trials may stink, I'm not going to lie, but they serve many purposes as we've explored. One of them is to tie people close together. Suffering together brings trust, camaraderie, mutual respect, and so much more. So David and Jonathan's love for each other was that kind of love. It was birthed in God, in the Spirit. Jonathan even loved David the way Christ commands us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. So this is from God. The beginning and end of this relationship was from God. But verse 4 is something specific worth highlighting. The Bible says Jonathan gave David his robe and his weapons. This is more than just a nice gift for his friend. This speaks prophetically about what's going to happen with David. Jonathan, probably by the Spirit, recognized David would become the next king. Keep in mind, Jonathan is the prince and heir to Saul. And this gesture was an act of faith on Jonathan's part to express his acknowledgement that David would be the future king, giving him what, you know, in the natural is rightfully his inheritance, the kingdom represented by the robe and the weapons. And he gives it to David to say, I know what's going to happen. I'm not going to be the next king, but I'm not envious of it. I'm not going to oppose it. Instead, I'm going to acknowledge that my friend will be the next one. He's going to take my place. And so he does it without reservation. If we look ahead, we know that's the case. Jonathan never becomes king. But there doesn't seem to be a shred of resentment in his heart about what will happen. He does this with love. He's eager to see his friend walk in that inheritance. He was in every way nothing like his father Saul. He knew David would become the next king, and he gladly embraced it. And this act was kind of like a handoff, like handing off the baton. Here, this is you. You will, follow, you will follow in Saul's footsteps. You will become the next king. I'm verifying it. I'm acknowledging it. I'm putting my stamp of approval on it by giving you my own clothing and armor. So we come to verse 5, and it describes David's early success in Saul's army. And for a season, he prospered while serving the king. Now, this verse is more critical than you might realize because it shows us how the people th saw David. The Bible says that his promotion and success was pleasing in their sight, as well as in the sight of Saul's servants. Of course, this was the Lord's doing. From the moment Samuel anointed David back several chapters ago, he experienced this kind of promotion. People respected and appreciated David after years of being last in his family. Now, this is important because David will one day become king. And God is already preparing Israel for that moment. Now, if you think about it, this story we're so used to, but if you think about it at the time, a transition from one king to another, especially from another family line, could have led to all kinds of chaos. And if you look ahead in 2 Samuel, there is 
very critical moments that could have made or, bro made or broken David's kingdom. Civil war could break out if loyalists to Saul resisted David's ascension. And this is especially problematic for a tribal nation like Israel. Twelve tribes, all of their own history and family lines. And the tribe of Benjamin, which was Saul's tribe, would have resisted and opposed a man from Judah taking over. However, even now, David had favor with Saul's own servants and the rest of the people. And this would prove extremely important in the years to come. And that's many, many years later from where we are now, but God is already establishing this important moment. And this highlights, once again, God's overall plan for the nation. Way back in the beginning of 1 Samuel, I explained this book links the time of the judges to the kingdom era. And God's plan has, was always to transform Israel from a ragtag group of tribes trying to settle and dominate the promised land into a mighty nation, and by some standards, a world power. But in this book, we see they messed up because they demanded an earthly king to lead them instead of keeping God as their king. So God first rebukes them by giving them what they wanted. Saul, an impressive-looking man who they assumed was king's, king material. But Saul was not fit to be king despite his impressive stature and military prowess. Sadly, he was a coward who prized men's opinions over God's. So God needed to teach Israel to stop looking at outward appearances and he needed to show them the error of their way by living through it so that they would stop thinking about men to deliver them. But after that, he revealed to the nation the right king, a man of faith who chased after God's desires. This is the only kind of leader the people of God should want. And clearly, David was so important because of how his life and character gives us a glimpse into the life, ministry, and character of the Messiah. Now we are seeing Israel respond properly to David, thanks to the work that God has been doing long before David arrived on the scene. So there's a lot we could take away from this, just this one reality. That there are times God brings us through situations to teach us something that we were too stubborn to learn on our own. Ideally, we could have just learned it from reading scripture or listening to God. But we, even as Christians, have stubborn heads and sometimes we have to live out something until it clicks. Just like Israel, they wanted a king and their own kind of idea of a king, so God had to give them that king so they learned that's not the type of person we want ruling over us. So that the right time, many years later, when God brings the right king, a man after his own heart, they recognize, no, we want someone like him. Someone who might not look the part of a king, but who is a man of God, of faith and obedience, who will lead us along the right path. That same thing is true for us sometimes. If we are too stubborn to listen to God's word and to be receptive to him, he will have to bring us through a difficulty just to teach us the truth. Now, that's not the only reason we go through difficulties, but that's sometimes one of the reasons. Now, we could avoid unnecessary hardship, kicking against the goads, as Christ said to Paul, by simply being humble enough to recognize what God is saying to us when he says it. Isaiah 66 says, This is the man who I will esteem, one who is humble and contrite and who trembles at my word. That is the attitude we need to have. When God speaks to us, when he's teaching us from his word, whether it's through a message Sunday morning, whether it's through our devotional, whether it's through a book, whether it's through the Holy Spirit putting something on our hearts, we need to respond quickly and say, Yes, God, I receive this. Help me to understand this. Help me to obey this. Help me to live this out. So that he doesn't have to take us through some sort of difficult thing to us, for us to see, oh, I was wrong. That is the heart of repentance. Repentance in the Greek New Testament is metanoia, which means to change your mind. Many of us are holding on to thoughts, ideas, attitudes that are not in line with the word of God. Okay, it might not just be sin. It might just be some sort of idea we have about God based on other things that are, that's simply not true. So God, in his great mercy and grace and love, will come and speak to us and say, what you're believing here, that's not true. Get rid of it and start believing what I say. And someone who is humble and contrite, which means broken, crushed, 
submitted to God, and who trembles at his word, takes his word seriously. To tremble at God's word means when God's word is being spoken and being revealed to you, you immediately receive it as it is, the word of God. You accept it more than anything else. More precious than silver and gold is God's word to you, and you grab onto it like a lifeline, and you take it, you eat it like spiritual food, and that is what God will do in you, transform you. But notice, contrite means broken. You could either humble yourself and let God work in you, or you could be stubborn, and then God has to break you himself. Trust me, you don't want to be on that other end. Because if we are not wise enough to humble ourselves to break down our pride and submit to God and to take seriously what he's teaching us, then he will find a way to do it himself. And it will not be something you enjoy. We're not talking about trials meant to refine you that all Christians go through. We're talking about trials called discipline that needs to crack you on your thick skull and wake you up. God had to do this with Israel through the failings of Saul until they were ready for someone as wonderful as David. We don't have to go through that if we are humble and contrite and tremble, take seriously, revere, and obey, believe his word. The other thing we could learn from this uh, verse is that God is always at work. He is doing things we can't even guess at. God was preparing the nation for David long before David comes on the scene. But he's doing this not because you're so great or important or because you need all this attention or success. He's doing it for his own purposes. As we said, God was doing something in Israel, teaching them not to trust in men, but in God. In God's timing and plan, he brought the right king to the right place at the right time so that people could embrace him. And so God does the same thing in our own lives. Not so that we could be puffed up and promoted like, David, yeah, I deserve to be in this place. Or for you to get your best life now. But so that through you, he could reveal himself to others. So right now, there are people, maybe people we haven't even met yet, that God will one day use you to speak to. You don't have to be a pastor or a preacher for this to happen. If you call yourself a believer in Christ, he's going to use you to be a witness somewhere to someone in some way. And right now... It might be even years before you even cross that person's path. He is preparing them so that when you show up and you speak, they can receive it. It has nothing to do with you. You may never even see them again. But God is doing it right now so that when the time comes, they will have hearts receptive to what you say. Also that he can receive the praise, glory, and honor. God's plan is to be glorified in us. But that only happens when he does the work by grace and not us in our flesh. So when we are obedient to his plans, and we trust his timing, his power, and his wisdom, he will work through us. So our focus needs to be on him and what he's teaching us, not on what we need to do or what we want to do. God doesn't need our help like we saw when David killed Goliath. But when the time is right, he will position us to be in the right place, He'll put his words in our mouth and he will give us the opportunity so that through us, we don't receive the glory, but he receives the glory. So in the coming passage, Saul notices how the people are flocking to David and he finally puts two and two together. How does he react? What does this mean for David? We're going to find out next time. This has been the Lightning Podcast. Our website is lightningpodcast.org. Check us out on Facebook and Spotify and Apple Podcasts.